Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And uh, we're going to go back a little bit. Uh, you can see there's a chart in front of you. But uh, uh, before we look at this, uh, let us begin with a word of prayer. Uh, dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this morning and that we can study together and we invite your spirit's presence. We pray that as we um, come close to you, that we can come close to one another and that your Holy Spirit can speak, that we can communicate effectively, that we can be corrected, um, that we can listen uh, to your voice speaking, even if it's speaking through others, and um, that we can understand your word and the light for this time. We ask for your care uh, for those that are searching for truth. We ask for your angel's protection. And we ask that you can be here in our midst. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, Ron. So uh, yesterday we looked at this even four times. So I, I, I promised to put this chart together. And I noticed some things. So that even four time is... Uh, the last phrase in Daniel 11, verse 24. And, and we had looked at this because it was, you know, um, and, and I need to make a chart also of the history of that. But we had two, the idea of a time, uh, th uh, 6256, the Hebrew number, is it represents uh, a prophetic year, right? So the symbol of 360. And so they used it to be 360 years right so a prophetic like a day for a year the day represents one solar year of 365 and a quarter whatever days um but if we take the time the word time or years and we're going to use it it's going to be 360 when we count 365 just to be clear um but it does represent a year of 365 days <clears throat> and we sometimes have used it uh, to represent years of 360 days as symbols. So it does work out symbolically in, in many situations. But uh, anyway, we're not looking at that right now. We're not looking at the 360 years, and there was two of them from 48 BC to 13, uh, 313 AD to the, um, uh, the, the Edict of Milan. And then we had the one from the Battle of Actium. That's the most common one that we would know of, know of from 31 BC to 330 when the capitals moved from Rome to Constantinople by Constantine, right? So, so those we know. But what we wanted to look at is an application of a time in our history. And what we're doing in our history is we're just using the symbol of the number 6256 as a period of days. And we noted it, it that it's uh, 17 years and 47 days. And if we count from 11, nine, um, it's going to bring us to December 25th, right? So that's gonna be 17 years apart, right? And then what, what I had noticed is if we counted from December 25th, 2021, the end of the 777 days, so we count back, Six two five six days. Now that's an inclusive count. It will bring us to November 9th, uh, 2004, which is the center of the 30 years from November 9th, 1989, uh, to November 9th, 2019. So the fact that it brings us to the center of those 30 days, which are 30 years, which are obviously two periods of 15 years. Um, and we can see that if we go from 11.989 to 11.904, that's 579 cardinal days. And if we go from 11.904 to 11.919, that's 5,479 inclusive days, right? Altogether, it's um, uh, 10,900 and what was it? 87 or 97? 87, 87, if I remember correctly. 10,900 and just checking here. Yeah, 57, pardon me. That, that makes more sense. Yeah, 10,957 days is 30 years. And remember, we had that in our, um, in our lines when we were, whoops, 
we have that in our lines uh, dealing with just trying to remember which which phrase it was. It was a phrase from yeah, it was three three one six and seven six four one uh added together and that came from the story of Jephthah. Right. So that was Jephthah was three three one six and then seven six four one was Shibboleth. Right. So the added together was ten thousand nine hundred and fifty seven days. So so we know that thirty years is ten thousand nine hundred and fifty seven days. So it's a very interesting little detail. We have the thirty years and then we have uh, this division. Now um the the Hebrew number for five four seven nine is interesting. Okay, so it, it's actually five four seven nine is a name that means chainful. It's so tai, so it's so tay, how would you say that? Um an ancestor of the family of Solomon's servants who returned from exile with Zerubbabel, right? It means changeful. And and of course that five four seven nine inclusive days is five four seven eight days. And and that refers to well, Brown's Drivers Briggs gives the definition of awful in O F F A L, which is a word that I was not familiar with. And that's that's the entrails of an animal, right? So that's something and it also can refer to the sweepings. Um and that's what Strong's gives as a definition for that word, something swept away that is filth, um, which kind of reminds us of Miller's dream. So anyway, it's just it's just a note here that, uh, and it is in that history in um, 2004. I don't know if we have November 9th as a date, but that we begin looking at. Uh, the charts in a lot more detail and the 2520 and so forth. Um, so obviously I don't think, I don't have a date of November 9th and 04, but this would be, of course, the dirt brush man. So anyway, just some symbols there. But the other thing was the word even. So we hadn't looked at that yesterday. We just had looked at the word time. And if we look at the word even, 5704, and we count it from the center of this chiasm, it's going to bring us to uh, June 22nd, 2020. So that, of course, is the date in which uh, the message of July 18th goes international media, right? I mean, it's not like a headline in the news, but it, it is something that goes international. And And that's interesting because uh, June 22nd is 226 days from November 9th, 2019. So we just have this, and I'll make this a little bigger for people who don't have uh, as good a screen to look at. So if we just zoom into this part here, you can see there's this 226 days, and that's that's just a cardinal count. If I did an ordinal count, it would bring me to 621, the day that the... Uh, the advertisement is published in the Tennessean, right? On the Sunday, June 22nd is the Monday. And we know that from June 22nd to December 25th, 2020, the bombing of Nashville is 187 inclusive days, 186 cardinal days, or we could say it's 187 cardinal days from the publication in the Tennessean. So, so it ties in that July 18, 2020 symbol, or July 18 symbol to uh, the bombing of Nashville in 2020 on December 25th. And then you can see that a time um, can represent a prophetic year, but we could also say that it represents a year, and that is 365 days. So I probably should put uh, the date there on the next one, even though it's pretty obvious. Uh, but I'll just do it like this. So on this line, you're going to have 1225. Right. So we got December 25th, 187 days. So I'll move this over a bit. That makes sense. So, so going back to this, um, cause they're going to forecast their devices against the strongholds or from the strongholds, even for a time. And so we have two different interpretations of that text. And according to Swearingen, both of them should be uh, 
correct as far as these periods of 360 years. And here we have um, uh, these going back to September 11th to uh, October 28th. So just to remind you of that, that period of time here to October 28th, 2018, this is going to be the summary. Uh, so I'll put it in here, Jeff's summary. Oops, wrong keyboard. <laughs> So that's the summary he does of basically what was learned from October 13th. Uh, maybe you could say from October 3rd when TASS introduces November 9th, 2019. Um, and then uh, the support for it with the 391.5. And uh, so that summary uh, summarizes what happened at the camp meeting and uh, what followed with uh, understanding this, these symbols. Now, it's it's a very interesting video. I mean, to watch what Jeff says about Parminder, uh, what he says about me, and what he says about numbers and dates and so forth. It is on, you know, the July 18, 2020 study group. It's on the 2520 study group. I'm pretty sure I posted it. I have five different uh, groups that I always post the videos on. Any thoughts about this? Would would we take that this is is valid? That this even for a time um, gives us this center of this chiasm, and from the center of the chiasm, it gives us June twenty second, which has these witnesses. Any any comments? It looks logical. Okay, and it's consistent with what we've done at other times. Now, the one thing I haven't done here is put in. The number of days here and that should be you know if we're going to just count a cardinal number this would be 5101 i think right 5479 minus 377 yeah so 5501 i don't know if there's any significance in that 5101 i'm just going to look at the hebrew number see if there's anything about that it means to bray as an ass or to scream from hunger, according to Strong's, and uh, to bray or cry out, according to Brown Driver Spriggs. Machach. Machach. Yeah, so it's, I don't know if that means anything. It's the 682nd prime number. So that's just finishing tying up some loose ends that we had. So we started talking um, a little bit about uh, the, the following verses. And we hadn't really got too far. So um, it says that uh, he, pagan Rome, that's Octavian, the king of the north, shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south. So we have that being Egypt and Cleopatra under Mark Antony. With a great army and the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great army, great and mighty army. And he, Antony, shall not stand. Octavian defeated him in the battle of Actium, for they shall forecast his devices against him. Yea, that feed of the meat of his, the portion of his meat shall destroy him, and his army shall overflow, and many shall fall down slain. So we can see that this interpretation uh, is basically swearing guns. We have, uh, I need to open that up. Uh, has anybody been thinking about this verse or these verses here, 25 and 26, and what we can do with them? Do we re let this remain so very general in this first part of the verse where we have pagan Rome, Octavian, the king of the north? I mean, we have a general, a specific, and a prophetic basically all at the same time. Right. So, yeah, so we have uh, the main symbol, the king of the north. That's the symbol because we have he's going to come against the king of the south. So in, in um, right, so we have, you know, he shall stir up his power and courage. Um, let me see here. I'm just trying to find. No, I mean, what if I'm reading it right, and he shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south. 
right? Yeah. Okay. So we we need to look at at this in. I mean, we haven't really examined this yet, right? Just right. We just kind of accepted it. So I'm trying to see if I can. Okay. The he in the above passage, this is swearing again, would obviously still refer to pagan Rome, the new king of the north. Based on our understanding of Daniel 11, verse 5 to 15, the king of the south would still be Hellenistic Egypt. Yet after Octavian finally subjugated Egypt in 30 BC, this power would lose its status as the literal king, king of the south. Now, so he says that it loses its status as the literal king of the south. So one of the things that Swearingen does that we do, and uh, and we know that Uriah Smith doesn't do, is we don't take the king of the south in Daniel 11, verse 40, as referring to, um, well, how does he do that? Well, I mean, he has it referring to to literal Egypt. He doesn't have the king of the north referring to uh, the papacy as the king of the first north referring to Turkey. And then he has another power, France. So what I'm saying is he doesn't have the king of the south refer to France, right, in, in Daniel 11, verse 40. And, and so Swearingen has the same view that we have, that the king of the south refers to France. And he's marking it here that the king of the south, um, it, it does not apply literally anymore to Egypt. Now, I'm not sure if I would uh, agree with him there. I mean, obviously Egypt is defeated. Um, but I had always been marking the time when it moves from literal to spiritual as 538, because it, it's the cross where we go from literal to, to spiritual. And for uh, this counterfeit covenant week, the, tw- to the 2520 of Northern Israel, where you have two 1260s that counterfeits Christ's covenant week, um, the center of the cross would mark the, uh, the transition from literal to spiritual. That's why we can't have literally the king of the South in 1798, and the literal king of the north in 1798, uh, for the simple reason we can't use literal. It has to be spiritual. If we use literal, we'd have to use literal Babylon as well, right? Do we agree with that idea that we need to be consistent when we move? I would agree with that idea, yes. So we know spiritual Babylon is there in 1798, not literal Babylon. And we still see this, this error. Uh, within Adventism, uh, not just within the, the conference churches, but even within so-called present truth movements and even within our own movement where the literal and the spiritual get, uh, conflated, right? So they, you have something that's literal and something that's spiritual in your interpretation. Now, it doesn't mean that we can't take something from the literal and apply it as a symbol in our time. But, you know, we wouldn't be looking to, uh, you know, a war in Iraq as as a fulfillment of Bible prophecy as something to do with Babylon. Right. We we wouldn't do that. Doesn't mean we can't we can't see that that there's some symbolic things maybe in a war in Iraq that can be used that can parallel in other lines. But we wouldn't use that as a you know, a fulfillment of prophecy that a war in Iraq is, you know, Iraq is Babylon and look at the prophecies in Daniel and, or Revelation and try to apply them directly to what's happening in Iraq or something. But people have done that. Adventists have done it. Present truth Adventists have done it. And, and we have a hard time, uh, addressing that, uh, that problem when, when something's happening in the news and it appears to parallel in some way, uh, some prophecy. But we have to understand those prophecies and how they're applied. And history is repeated. So we can see history is being repeated um, of fulfilled prophecy. But we have to apply those correctly. So first we need the actual interpretation of the prophecy correctly. So we can't just, we can't just take the prophecy and apply it to events without understanding its fulfillment. Right. So it's it's the history in connection with the prophecy that is repeated, not the prophecy itself. And some people have a hard time with that. They want to say, oh, well, 
you know, we can just repeat this prophecy. It now has a literal fulfillment in our time where it may have had a spiritual fulfillment in the past. So we, we see that error constantly uh, being used. Okay, so and, so, and some people just have a hard time understanding the difference, but it's pretty clear that the difference is when you understand the historical application, that means you're not open to just reinterpret the prophecy in different ways, right? Which if you believe that the prophecy is repeated, you can just, you know, it's pretty open uh, in interpreting that to events that are happening or about to happen. And when people do that, uh, they draw wrong conclusions and they usually try to apply literal time. So it's usually connected with time setting of some sort. And which is what this movement was accused of. And in some ways, uh, people in this movement were doing things similar to that, not, not the movement itself per se, but, and, and we'll see this when we go into the symbolic use of numbers and the studies on Sabbath as we start looking at, um, how we were doing things and how some people were doing things within the movement. Okay. So anyway, we have this, um, this change that the he marks here as happening in 30, just because Egypt is defeated. But we would know that, that Egypt still has a role, you know, so, so I, I'm not sure exactly if I would agree with him there. Okay. Um, and then we know uh, that we had, uh, like in the in the previous section, we had the destruction of Jerusalem, right? So I'm not really sure what Swearingen is saying here. He's going to deal with Ptolemy. Well, I'm going to read what he says about Ptolemy, Tal- uh, not Ptolemy, uh, Pompey, and and then he's going to talk about Ptolemy. Um, Okay, it says, while Pompey was in the process of subjugating Judea Syria in 64-63 BC, he was aided by the Egyptian king Ptolemy XI Alutes, who was later driven out to Rome in exile because of a revolt in Alexandria in 58 BC. After a usurper named Archelaus was placed on the Egyptian throne, the exiled Ptolemy XI appealed to the Roman Senate for his restoration of power in 57 BC. After securing a senatorial support, he would recruit one Olus Gabinius, the proconsul of Syria and protege of Pompey, to lead an actual invasion of Egypt in 55 BC. The military operation proved to be a success, resulting in the death of Archelaus. Uh, Thus, this restoration of power left Ptolemy XI indebted to Rome. And Ptolemy XI died in 51 BC. His will revealed that he had bequeathed Egypt to Rome with the stipulation that his two oldest children, Cleopatra VII and Ptolemy XII, Theus Philopater, uh, should marry and reign jointly. Caesar would eventually appear in Egypt after his defeat of Pompey at Pharsalus in 48 BC to settle a dynastic dispute that would eventually take place between these two co-regions. He justified his presence by stating that he was there on official Roman business to serve as an arbitrator uh, in the conflict between the king and queen. Yet, in reality, Caesar coveted the wealth and resources of the rich land of the Nile and determined to extend his stay. This would lead to an armed rebellion against the Roman presence in Egypt, which resulted in the Alexandrian War. So this was the history that I'd studied. Um, So there's a lot of stuff in that history. So this is just leading up to understanding what's going to happen. So this stirring up his power and his courage against the king of the south, right? And then the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great army, right? So that's going to be the response. After Caesar's death in 44 BC, the king of the south would be stirred up to battle once again, coming with a very great and mighty army against the king of the north. This would become a reality through the influence of Mark Antony, whose authority over Egyptian affairs after the death of Caesar had essentially made him the king of the south. While pagan Rome, under the authority of Octavian, would constitute the king of the north, this growing rivalry would lead to an inevitable showdown for control of the Roman world. Antony had initially formed an alliance known as the Second Triumvirate with both Octavian and Marcus Aemilius Lepidus, with 
the express purpose of eliminating the murders of Caesar and removing their own political opponents. When the triumvirs divided the empire in 40 BC, Antony assumed control of the eastern provinces, which would exclude Egypt, thus making him the king of the south, while Octavian would retain portions of the king of the north, which would include Rome itself, thus making him the king of the north. So here in this situation, it seems like we're having a civil war within Rome uh, where we have uh, Octavian as the king of the north and Antony as the king of the south. Is, is that, would we accept that? Because this is what swearing didn't say. Would we accept that idea? Now, we, we put, you know, Egypt and Cleopatra under Mark Antony, right? So Mark Antony is really the, the king of the south in this idea of Swearingen's. Octavian's the king of the north. So this is a type of civil war between um, Octavian or Caesar Augustus, not Caesar yet, and Mark Antony, right? All right. We, we, does that make sense, what he's saying, that we're going to take the symbol of the king of the south and attach it to Mark Antony? Well, historically, that could work. Yeah. Okay, so so we had a civil war between the north and the south in uh, Greece, and now that has moved to, that, that battle, in a sense, is still continuing, even though it's really under war, under under Rome, so that that... Egypt was given to Rome, according to what Swearingen is saying, uh, with the death of Ptolemy the Eleventh, right? So Ptolemy the Eleventh died, and in his will, he gives Egypt to Rome, but but it's it's still you know going to be controlled by his son and daughter who are supposed to be married, Ptolemy the Twelfth and Cleopatra the Seventh, but Rome is still kind of in charge of Egypt. It hasn't really conquered Egypt completely because they're still going to have these these kings, king and queen, still going to have the monarchy. Can we accept this like prophetically as a civil war then till we finally get to the point where they are conquered? The king of the south is truly conquered oh, to, to accept it prophetically or symbolically. No, this is the prophecy that that the prophecy is fulfilled by. Rome actually taking over Egypt, but it, it does so in a civil war with the idea of that the North and the South are now representing parts of Rome as a right. city, not two different nations, right? Because right. Un- under Greece, it was, I mean, you could say they're two different kingdoms, the Ptolemic, you know, and the Seleucid, but it's still this division of Greece. And so Rome in- inherits this these symbols of the king of the north and the king of the south, right? So, I mean, those are, 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 are symbols in a way, but they're literal here still, right? All right. Okay. And this, and that this is a direct fulfillment of prophecy. We're not making an application outside of this prophecy. We're just saying that Rome is in a civil war. That's the question because Egypt's been given to Rome, but in order for it to ultimately conquer it, there has to be this civil war. And and Mark Antony, he he wants to be in charge, right? So he becomes the king of the south. I mean, it's Egypt, Mark, but Mark Antony is really the one who represents the king of the south if Octavian's the king of the north. Because right? you asked the question about pagan Rome, Octavian, king of the north. It's obviously pagan Rome. But Rome also is owning Egypt at this time, according to swearing, because of Ptolemy the Eleventh's uh, will, right? So this is going to lead to, you know, the the Battle of Actium, and then the ultimate defeat of the King of the South, right? So so we have the Battle of Actium, and then when the land of the Nile fell to his rival in the next year, Antony would not stand, committing suicide with Cleopatra thus allowing Octavian to emerge as the master of the Roman world. So the king of the north defeats the king of the south. We have the Battle of Actium, and we have the year later. So the Battle of Actium marks that start of the 360 years. If we count them cardinally, cardinally, if we count them ordinally, you could count from 30 BC 
to um, 330, no, still be 360 years, but it would just be an inclusive count. So are we happy with this interpretation that Swearingen has up to the Battle of Actium start of this 360 years? I don't know if that's an agreement or a disagreement. Yeah, it sounds like Ron's dog was disagreeing. But uh, anyway, anyone else? Well, I'm trying to to follow through on, on a point that you're verbally made, dealing with the will of Ptolemy the 11th. Okay. Yeah, so Swearingen says that the will of Ptolemy the 11th had bequeathed uh, Egypt to Rome with the condition that Cleopatra the seventh and Ptolemy the eleventh, but Ptolemy the twelfth, pardon me, uh, become king and queen and rule it. So, so it's kind of under Rome, but with this caveat. I mean, that's what I get. Do you, do you have information on that? Well, I'm. The reason I'm questioning this from Swearingen is that Ptolemy the 11th did not reign that long. Okay. He reigned in 80 BC. Yeah. Cleopatra, the one that we're dealing with, with Mark Antony and with Julius Caesar, didn't come along for quite a while. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm having to wonder if this is a typo on the point of those that were transcribing Swearingen's document, or if Swearingen himself entered something that was not correct, because I believe that it would have been the will of Ptolemy the Twelfth, leaving it to Ptolemy, not, not Ptolemy the Eleventh. Correct. I realize that's nitpicking, but it's still a major right. point. Okay, so. Yeah, well, it's important, I mean, to get things right. So, yeah, so it must be Ptolemy the 12th. Right. Okay, so, yeah, so, I mean, maybe I read it wrong. I'm just going to look at it. Um, yeah, must be, okay, honoring the late, the will of the late Ptolemy the 11th. No, he replaced Ptolemy 12th with his brother Ptolemy the 13th. Okay, so, no, it's correct. So if I'm, okay, it says here, um, honoring the will of the late Ptolemy the 11th, he replaced Ptolemy the 12th with his brother Ptolemy the 13th, also called Theos Philopater, who would also marry his sister Cleopatra and reign with her as co-regent. So this is in the will of Ptolemy the 11th. And so what Caesar is doing is honoring this so it is in the will of Ptolemy the eleventh. But Ptolemy the twelfth is the is the you know, the king or whatever at that time. Okay, because Ptolemy the eleventh died in eighty BC. Right. So in eighty BC that means that Egypt was bequeathed to Rome, but Rome hadn't done anything about it. So Caesar's now gonna do something about it. Okay, but eighty BC is seventeen years before Pompey comes mm -hmm. into that area. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So, um, so let me see if I can find. Well, no, I could. So, no, this one here. So, the one I read before, this one's a typo. When Ptolemy the 11th died in 51 BC, that should be Ptolemy the 12th. Right. Um, his will revealed he had bequeathed Egypt to Rome with the stipulation that his two oldest children, uh, Cleopatra the seventh and Ptolemy the twelfth. So this one actually he contradicts himself. Right. Okay. So so I don't know what he's done wrong here. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, somebody could look up the will of Ptolemy the, the twelfth. Um, and then we could probably figure that out. Yeah, it was Ptolemy the Twelfth's will that stipulated that Cleopatra the Seventh and her brother Ptolemy the Thirteenth should rule Egypt together. To safeguard his interests, he made the people of Rome executors of his will. That's so, 
since, yeah. since the Senate was busy with its own affairs, his ally, Pompey, approved the will. So, so by making them the uh, executors of his will, um, in doing so, that opens up this door for them to uh, come in and eventually conquer Egypt. So see, <clears throat> here, here's, the, here's the point. When okay. we're looking at this, Ptolemy X died in 88 BC. Yeah. Ptolemy X wrote a will that left Egypt to Rome in the event that he had no surviving heirs. Okay. Okay. So there, there's a whole progression of, of the King of the South sort of connecting itself to Rome. Correct. Mm -hmm. So Ptolemy XII continued a very pro-Roman policy to protect himself and secure his dynasty's fate. So in 65 BC, the Roman censor Marcus Licinius Crassius proposed that Rome annex Egypt. That's two years before Pompey takes to reorganize Syria and Anatolia. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this, so it's good swearing can make some uh, a, a typo there. So this shows this progression of, so the king of the south in our history, what is it revealing? What is it representing? So one of the things that we have looked at when we've try to address our present truth application of these lines is we sometimes look at, well, what does it mean overall in the bigger line, the line of the Seventh-day Adventist church and so forth. But it always seems to come down that this is actually addressing events in our history of the movement, right? It always seems to come closer to home. You know, we, especially when we start dealing with all these symbols and numbers and everything, it starts to go into our history, not so much the history of the Seventh-day Adventist church. Right? That's what we've been finding. Agreed. Okay. So we have these kings of the South as, you know, which would be a, I, I don't know, you know, how do we understand what the king of the North is and what the king of the South is? in relationship to our movement. Sometimes we're looking at this with the Democrats and the Republicans. Sometimes we get, you know, these these conflicts start to look like more like events that are happening within the movement. So, you know, for instance, when we looked at 23 and 24, those verses that we had just sort of finished off, you know, we could see, well, this starts at 9-11, but this is going to be fulfilled and we probably should fill this in. Uh, in red, the different things. Um, but this is going to address things happening in our movement itself. It's not so much what's happening with the Seventh-day Adventist Church, even because we start seeing that Pompey, well, does he represent Parminder? I mean, obviously, that would have nothing to do with the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Even though we see these, there is a connection between Parminder's movement and the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So, the way that I understand it is what happened with Parminder's group is exactly what's going to happen to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. That is, you're going to have a group of what we would call conservative Adventists, so to speak, you know, Adventism in, in its conservative sense, all of a sudden just flipping over and becoming woke and following the world, saying there is going to be no Sunday law. All of those things that Parminder was saying is the church saying them? And is it growing more and more in that direction? I'd have to think about that. Well, I mean, what was the church's stands, you know, to a large degree with BLM? Parminder's movement's going to be supporting that type of thing before the church is in that big way. And I mean, I know people, conservative Adventist ministers, People who would believe, you know, the daily is, you know, paganism blocking me, defriending me because I didn't support BLM, which which wouldn't have happened a few years before that, before 2020. So we're going to see Parminder's movement 
typifying what's going to happen in Adventism. That switch, right? Now that switch is still happening within Adventism. Um, but, but it, and it has been happening for a while. But for the, the Seventh-day Adventist Church to support a Sunday law, I mean, that's what we believe uh, will happen, that the institution itself will support a Sunday law because it's on that slippery slope. I mean, once down that path, it's going to be hard for the church to turn back. And, and not even just supporting a Sunday law because the state has it, but actually urging a Sunday law by the state. So being one of the instigators proposing the Sunday law, right? That's what we believe from what Ellen White has said. You know, in large meetings in the open air and so forth, Ellen White says, we're going to have our ministers with the hellish torch of false prophecy urging upon us the necessity of keeping the first day of the week. So that's the direction things are going. But if we're going to to look at this, um, and that's 23 and 24, we believe those are kind of a unit, right? That when we look at 25 and 29, we're, we're going to go back to that battle of acting, right? Because this is going to go all the way up to uh, the destruction of Jerusalem and then the diaspers, diaspora. So here, when we go back to the Battle of Acton, we keep going back, right? So we, we get a line of prophecy. It brings us up to a certain point, which symbolizes ultimately the Sunday law and what happens, right, in, in, in one way. But it also symbolizes things within our movement. So we can apply them typically to things like December 25th, 2021, which is a symbol of the Sunday laws, not a Sunday law then, but it's a symbol of it so that addresses something within our movement, which is then typifying something that's going to happen on a larger scale within Adventism. So does that make sense? So we have a historical application of Daniel. We have then a present truth application that applies to the, our movement. And that present truth application typifies what's going to happen on the big line. That is, just like Samuel Snow's letters typify October 22, 1844, our movement is more Samuel Snow's letters than anything else. And so it's a typification of what's going to happen. So we're going through an experience, even though we're a repeat of Millerite history, which is typifying this bigger line at the end that Jeff has. We have within it this application of this movement itself. And so I don't know if people can accept that or understand what that means. This could be part of the reason why, in a sense, we have a two present truth applications, one dealing with the church. But our symbols keep focusing it back upon the movement itself, because that's where we are right now. We're in this zoom into the Sunday law. We, aren't, we haven't reached the Sunday law yet. And that's why we can understand this history. And this typification has time attached to it. The Sunday law itself does not. That is, we can't predict the date of the Sunday law or the close of probation or a loud cry or any promise of, of special significance, right? Because we only have time in our movement. So when we get back to this, Dwight, um, so we, we have, as you're pointing out, we have this history of these Ptolemies, these kings of the South. It, now, it doesn't explicitly mention this here, uh, but it would be part of uh, Rome stirring up its power against the king of the south. And this is going to happen because the king of the south has opened the door to this happening. So going all the way back to Ptolemy X in, in his, his will. So it's his will that, how do, how do they put it here? Well, what I'm, what I'm going to have to do is read some of the, the other history. Because the the first time I'm seeing this is that Ptolemy the tenth places in his his will that if he has no legitimate heir that he wanted Egypt to go to Rome. Now, yeah, now this of course is a constant rumor, right? So whether that actually occurred or not, we don't know. So it's a constant rumor that an earlier king, Ptolemy the tenth, 
ruled the uh, ruled the rule of Egypt to Rome after his death in 88 BC. Okay, now add who, to the social dissension that already existed. Who Paul is Paul. That? What's that? Is that from Swearingen? No, this is um, uh, from a, his, a Roman history website. Okay, well. I was going to look at doing a little deeper dive on this because what I'm reading right now is discussing not only was Ptolemy the 12th seeking closer relations with Rome that he had borrowed a very substantial amount of money from a Roman banker and that for a while had sought not only the protection, but the, the total friendship of Rome. Okay. So I don't have much more directly. I mean, I'm seeing from what I'm reading right now that there was a point where Ptolemy the Twelfth was in Rome. He was in exile in Rome. And he actually had a restoration and a second reign in Egypt. Right. So what I have here from this uh, Roman history website, it says Ptolemy the Twelfth ruled precariously from eighty one from eighty BC to fifty one BC. During those years, murder and bribery to keep the throne marked his rule. Ptolemy borrowed incredible sums of money from Roman moneylenders and used it to bribe such prominent politicians as Crassus and Caesar himself. Doing so helped prop up prop up his feeble reign, but also soured the people of Egypt against him. The constant rumor that an earlier king, Ptolemy X, willed the rule of Rome of Egypt to Rome after his death in 88 BC helped add the social to the social dissension that already existed. Ptolemy XII was seen as too weak to stand up to the Romans for true Egyptian independence. As a result of the will, and in the face of the Mediterranean piracy, Rome used the, the excuse to send Marcus Porteus. Cato to annex the Egyptian territory of Cyprus in 58 BC. Ptolemy protested but did little more uh, and open revolt against his rule became a widespread disaster shortly thereafter. In 55 BC, he would be restored through the bribery of the first triumvirate and other Roman officials, including Paulus Gabinius, governor of Syria. Gabinius invaded for the hefty price of 10,000 silver talents and forced Ptolemy the 12th back to the throne. Right. And then it says this wasn't the end of the tr his troubles. However, in a later attempt to secure Roman support in other matters, his daughter Berenice the fourth and Cleopatra the sixth seized the throne while their father was away. Upon his return, he had them executed. You know, typical. And suddenly the nondescript third daughter, Cleopatra the seventh was propped into position as the oldest child and heir to Egypt. When Ptolemy XII died in 51 BC, Cleopatra, at the tender age of 17, fell into joint rule with her younger 13-year-old brother Ptolemy XIII. The two were expected to marry, as was the Egyptian Macedonian royal custom, just as it's likely that Cleopatra's mother was her own aunt, Cleopatra V. They inherited a throne in deep financial debt to Rome, etc. Anyway, now, I mean, this is one of the points that Stephen had been making earlier about he will give him the daughter of women, right? Talking about this marriage, right, Stephen? That's what you were saying, that, that that's one way that that's interpreted, that earlier verse. It's about this marriage between Cleopatra the Seventh and Ptolemy the Thirteenth. Stephen? Hello, yes. Yeah. Is that where, so that was what you were referring to before? Yes. Yeah, okay. So, and I mean, it's always a possibility that that's what it's referring to, but we, we took it a little bit different that, that that was God intervening in this history. But in that case, the he would be a Caesar giving uh, him, Ptolemy the, the 13th, the daughter of women, Cleopatra, but she would not stand by him and etc. But we, we looked at that. Anyway, that's what you're referring to. Okay. Just want to yes. clear. Okay. Okay. I'm just going to read on here a little bit about this because uh, this has some of the stuff that we're talking about here. 
Uh, fortunately for the young rulers of Egypt, Rome was too preoccupied to act on the will of Ptolemy XII, which likely granted significant reparations. Cleopatra stepped into the forefront of Egyptian politics, mostly ignoring her younger brother. Her young brother, rule was practiced essentially only in her name, and she likely created a significant rift within the Alexandrian elite class. By the time civil war broke out between Caesar and Pompey, along with the Republican forces in 49 BC, Cleopatra was firmly in control of Egypt. However, Gabinius, the man who had restored her father to the throne just six years prior, was still settled in or near Egypt with the bulk of his forces, and he was a supporter of Pompey. When Pompey fled Italy from Caesar's advancing armies, he naturally looked to his supporters in the east for aid, making Gabinius, and therefore Egypt, a likely target. Pompey requested 50 Egyptian ships and grain supplies for his men from Cleopatra, who had little choice but to comply. When word spread that yet another Egyptian ruler had cowed before Rome, the backlash was terrible. The Egyptian aristocracy, and likely the bulk of the population, immediately came to support her brother Ptolemy XIII, and Cleopatra was ousted from power. She fled to the east, Arabia and Palestine, where she recruited her own army to wrest control back from her brother. By the time Cleopatra began to march west, however, Caesar had won the Battle of Pharsalus, and the man she supported in the Roman conflict was lost. As Pompey fled to Egypt, the motivation for Ptolemy XIII to behead him and present it as a gift to Caesar was quite clear. Not only would he provide Caesar with proof of his rival's death, but he thought it thought to ingratiate himself by showing that he never supported Pompey, unlike his sister. When Caesar arrived with just 4,000 men, or just under one full legion, he immediately took over the palace and presumed to secure his authority. Though tensions were strained with the locals, the Egyptian armies of both sides were facing off in the Egyptian delta, and Alexandria was open to Caesar. Despite tension and resistance from the general Achilles, uh, Caesar managed to secure his position. He had three goals while in Egypt. Secure, secure grain and repayment of Egyptian debts, and also to settle the matter of who should rule. Caesar privately requested a meeting with Cleopatra in order to take stock of her before making a decision. But her return to the palace while her brother's ministers controlled the city, despite Caesar's legion, was perilous at best. The young queen devised a plan to get to Caesar and block any attempts by her brother to secure the throne without her saying the matter. So, so I mean, I've studied this history, uh, you know, Caesar and Alexandria, what happens, how Cleopatra gets to Caesar, um, and uh, eventually Caesar manages to escape, in a sense. So he, he becomes trapped in the city of Alexandria during his siege of Alexandria. Um, so, I mean, there's lots in here. Um, to sort of sort it out, you know, a lot of detail that the Bible doesn't give us, right? So, you know, often we want to stick to what the scriptures are saying as far as understanding this history. So, so we need to know what, what is being said. Mm. Okay. So that's a little bit off to the side there, just kind of examining that. So when we look at, uh, so this is later, right? We have Caesar Augustus or Octavian before he becomes Caesar Augustus. He, we have all of this background of what has happened with Egypt, right? So we've had, um, this rumor about Ptolemy X, um, giving, uh, Rome the control of, of Egypt. And then this sort of battle over the throne of Egypt. Uh, after the death of Ptolemy the 11th between Cleopatra and her brother Ptolemy the 13th. But later on, we now have Octavian, because of all this unrest within Egypt, all of this dissension, um, he's able to come and, and Mark Antony, of course, is now the king of the south. 
he's going to defeat Mark Antony and Cleopatra in the Battle of Actium, right? So, so we know that that stirring up his power and his courage against the King of the South, um, this would be Octavian. So it is pagan Rome, and there is sort of precursors to this, but but we can't really go too far back with this of where it's placing us. It's it's bringing us to the time of Octavian because Mark Antony is going to be the king of the South. So this is that civil war that exists in Rome. So, so we can say this is a civil war. After all that sort of diversion, it, it adds to what we're saying. Now, what about uh, the characteristics of, so he's going to have his courage. Well, that refers to the heart, right? And the Hebrew word for heart is onomatopoeic. Uh, can you guess what the word for heart is in Hebrew? Anybody guess without looking it up? Labab, right? That's a heartbeat. But we would say labdab, right? You know, labdab, labdab. But it's labab. So it's kind of interesting. Okay, so that's um, so that's what his courage is. And his power, uh, koak, this means to be firm, vigor, literally force. It could be capacity, means, produce. And it, and it really refers to some lizard as well from its hardiness, so its ability. Uh, able, chameleon, it's translated as chameleon, force, fruits, might, power, strength, substance, well. Okay. <clears throat> and this stirring up or means to like wake up or lift itself up. So like that's why you could think of an animal stirring, uh, waking up and, and rising. So how would we then, why would we apply this to Octavian, this power and courage against the king of the south? Is there anything that we can see there? I don't directly know how to answer your question. So I'm going to have to study a bit more. Okay. Well, well, the idea here is that we have, he says it's Octavian, right? And he's going to stir up, that is, like somebody waking up, like in a, you know, waking up and arising, his power and his courage against the king of the south. So this, this is going to, and, and, I, and I've studied the history of this. I mean, this would describe Octavian in connection with this battle, because it's not, it's not a sudden thing. In a, in a, you could say in a sense, I mean, Octavian, whatever his plans are. But Mark Antony is not his enemy, right? I mean, they're, they're part of this triumvirate, right? But they're going to become enemies. So Octavian has this, this ambition. Mark Antony wouldn't have considered uh, Octavian his enemy. So it, it develops over time. Okay, so now we have uh, power and courage. So together, those two are, are going to be uh, 7,403 days, I believe. Well, 7,405 days. Did I do that right? Yeah, 7,405 days. Now, from 9-11 to... 7, 000, uh, to December 25th, 2021. So if we go 9-11, December 25th, 2021, it's 7,410 days. So if we count from 9-11 and we go 7,405 days, it brings us to December 20th, 2021. It's going to be uh, five days short of December 25th, 2021. Can we take that as significant? I mean, it's five days short of December 25th, 2021. So 7,405 days, not 7,410 days. Is December 25th, uh, December 20th, 2021 significant? It's interesting because when you write it out digitally. 12, 12, 20, 21. 12 20 20 21 oh 12 20 20 21 yeah yeah if you write it all out long or yeah i see what you're saying okay <clears throat> now um 
what about just December 20 itself? Is that a symbol that we have anywhere? I don't recall. I mean, it's, I mean, if we counted a, uh, you know, from the end of September 11th, it'd bring us to December 21st, 2021. We do have December 12th or December 21, 2012, which is a reverse of 21 as part of a structure of the 777 structure. So, um, but that goes to December 25th. <clears throat> so there's some symbols in there to some degree, but that could relate to our lines. But, but anyway, it's just some, some detail I noticed. It's five days short of from September 11th, 2001 to December 25th, 2021. Now I know in that time I'm preparing for that, uh, those meetings that I had invited everyone to, and I'm going to be, you know, addressing details of, um, to go back there, you know, talking with the different groups and trying to schedule the meetings, but I don't know anything specific about that date. Yeah, we could count it to uh, December 21st, 2021, which would mirror us with December 21st, 2012. So we, we have that part. We can, we can figure this out. Now, as far as the King of the South being Mark Antony, so we have Egypt and Cleopatra under Mark Antony as the King of the South. But we're saying really Octavian's the King of the North, Antony's the King of the South, Mark Antony. Now, of course, here Rome is not called the King of the North, right? Because we're going to have, um, we have the King of the South. And the last time we had the King of the North um, mentioned is quite a bit earlier. Right? So we, we keep using these terms, King of the North and King of the South, but I think it's actually a good verse 15. Um, it's the last time we actually get the phrase King of the North. I'm just going to check. I might be missing something. Yeah. So in verse 15 is the last time we get the phrase King of the North until we get to verse 40, right? So the phrase King of the North isn't occurring, but we keep talking about it as the King of the North. But the King of the South is still being mentioned, you know, directly by name. And of course, when we get to chapter 40, uh, we're going to have the King of the North and the King of the South. But we know that in this case, the King of the North and the King of the South in Daniel 11, verse 40, are not to be taken as the literal territory of the king of the north or literal territory of the king of the south. But these are now to be understood spiritually, just as we had understand Babylon spiritually. And so the king of the north is going to be uh, the papacy. The king of the south is going to be France in Daniel 11 verse 40. But here Rome is the king of the north, even though, you know, it's not going to use that phrase. It's going to be uh, pagan Rome. It becomes the king of the north. So when we get to this idea of this civil war and this civil war is going to be uh, dealing with the Battle of Actium and then finally what happens in 30 BC with the defeat of Egypt. So normally we have a king of the north and the king of the south. So the king of the north comes again. So the king of the south first comes against the king of the north, Raphia, and then the king of the north comes and defeats the king of the south. Uh, Pinium, right? So, if the king of the north is defeating the king of the south, would this not be Pinium, a type related to Pinium? Likely. Now, we had Caesar Augustus representing, when we were dealing with the presidents of the United States, he's going to represent uh, Obama, right? And And we had decided that we don't have to consistently use that symbol to always referring to uh, the presidents of the United States, right? I would think that to be correct. That there are times we do that, that Augustus is going to represent Obama, but other times he doesn't. And that's because we're, we're basically in different lines, that this is not one continuous line. Uh, in Daniel chapter 11, we have different lines, and they, they start at the place. So the king of the north defeating the king of the south, we can place it at different places, right? Because the battle of, of uh, Paneum, we can say 
the Battle of Raffia, 1798, and the Battle of Panians at 1989. And so we could place this at 1989. Obviously, uh, the president is not Obama in 1989, right? So that's where, I, where I'm going here with how we're trying to understand this. That when we take these verses, we put them back, and we, we have our line of our history, and we can take these and place them in our line. Now, we know that November 9th, 1989, and September 11th, 2001, and no, November 11, or November 9th, you know, uh, 2019, all share the same symbol. And that we can, we can say that the, they're all the same way mark in, at certain times, right? That is, we, we could say, well, this is 1989. We could also say, uh, that it's 2019. So it could be something within our movement that we mark it 2019 when, when the king of the north de- defeats the king of the south, right? So, so we have lots of different options on how to understand this. Now, remember, it's not, it's not the king of the north. I mean, it doesn't say Octavian's the king of the north. We have that in brackets that's added. But well, we do have a king of the south, so it's implied that the, that whatever is the king of the north here, this is a symbol when we're applying it to our time. We, we take that symbol. What does that symbol mean? And symbols can have more than one meaning. And and in our history within this movement, uh, the south represents wokeism, and the north represents conservatism. Right? Agreed. So within this movement, can we say that there has been a battle between the king of the north and the king of the south? And, and neither are necessarily good or bad, right? I mean, they are good and bad in some ways, both of them. But can we say that 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 there has been a battle going on between conservatism and liberalism, or whatever you want to call it, wokeism? I don't know if I like calling it liberalism because it doesn't really symbol much of of traditional ideas of liberalism. So the Battle of Actium, I mean, we have these these structures, right? So what we had said, going back to the beginning of this study, we basically had had done this already. So we had taken the Battle of Actium that has this 360 years, two periods of it, and we applied two periods of the symbol for 360 years, 6256, and we tied together... 9-11 and 11-9, right? Plus the end of our line, December 25th, 2021. So can we see that the Battle of Actium is here being represented within this movement? Can we agree with that? Or is that a stretch? And it's not just the Battle of Actium. As well, it must have also something to do with the other period, which is from the Battle of Pharsalus to uh, the Edict of Milan. And so we would have to explore this further and how these parallels fit. So remember, that was the end of verse 24 that gave us this even for a time. But it's pointing forward to the period from the, the Battle of Pharsalus to the Edict of Milan and the Battle of Actium to the movement of the capital from Rome to Constantinople. And that that parallels things within our movement as symbols. Right. Not necessarily because we don't have anything on November 9th, 2004, as a specific date, unless we could somehow uh, find that in the structure dealing with um, uh, what happened in the movement in 2004 in connection with understanding the 2520 and, and all of those other truths connected to that. Right. The understanding of 9-11 itself. OK, so we just got. Uh, we're over time here. So anyway, we'll come back to this tomorrow. And uh, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning. We ask for your continued presence throughout this day and that you can bring us together again to study your word. And we pray that um, you can help us to understand these things. Again, we ask for your angels' care and protection in all that we do. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.